Hello and welcome everyone to a new episode here on the War of the Rebellion podcast for Age Civil War. I'm your host, Niels Eichhorn. And today feels like another day in the Irish world. We are going to talk about some more Irishmen today. This time, however, with a historian. Last time we had a literary scholar. So today we are joined by Ian Delant Delahanty. He yep. is a professor, associate professor. He just came back from faculty senate before the meeting here. <laughs> he is an associate professor of history at Springfield College in Massachusetts with a PhD from Boston College. So very New England in outlook. And we are talking about, I think I got that right, his first book, yep. Embracing Emancipation, A Transatlantic History of Irish Americans, Slavery, and the American Union, 1840 to 1865, published this summer, 2024, by Fordham University Press. So first of all, Ian, thank you so much for joining me here today and taking some time this afternoon for you in, in in Massachusetts out of your busy teaching schedule. So you already told me before the interview you are Irish American, not Irish. And a little bit of a little bit of some other little, things too. So it's a little yeah, a it's pretty common. British Isles and you know some some other parts too. So how do you how do you write a book about the Irish? So I. I <laughs> When I was in grad school, um, I had an office across from our director of graduate studies, and I would often hear him talk with prospective uh, applicants. And the one thing he would always say is, you know, in your letter of interest, don't talk about the family trip you, trip you took to Gettysburg when you were a kid. And I always wondered if, if it was a subtle message at me because that was exactly what got me interested uh, in this project. Um, when I was, I think, 19 years old, I went to Gettysburg. Uh, you know, did the battlefield tour, but was struck by the Irish Brigades monument there at this oh, giant Celtic yeah. cross, mm -hmm. rocks, uh, you know, the Irish wolfhound at the base of it, and how just different and, and distinct it was from virtually all other monuments in the field. Yeah. And that really just kind of kindled, you know, an interest in the Irish involvement and experience of the American Civil War that, you know, really just kind of came to fruition, I guess, with the publication of the book, you know, however many years later now, so... Um, yeah, and it, it was a doctoral dissertation originally at Boston College um, that kind of laid dormant for a little while once I started a really teaching focused position uh, here at Springfield College and then um, finally wanted to get it across the finish line and, and did so as of June. So, yeah. Nice. Well, congratulations. It it does take a while Thanks. to get those books done, especially with a heavy teaching load. Um but yeah, no, it, it's interesting how Gettysburg comes back in so many ways <laughs> to people. Like that's the movie was what started me on the path on the American Civil yeah. War, actually. So it's it's yeah. it's really interesting and in how that battle still influences people. Yeah. Um <clears throat> so as somebody who also has studied the Irish and kind of looked at especially immigration studies, 48er studies, um, in your case, obviously, like the potato famine refugees yeah. that you're getting. You are using a really interesting approach at looking at the Irish because you you don't start once they're getting off the boat. Yeah. So yeah. tell me, tell us a little bit about why why did you feel it was important to start with all these guys in Ireland? Yeah, so I, you know, I was I guess trained, if you will, as an immigration historian. Uh, my mm -hmm. advisor Kevin Kenny, you know, um, is, is a leader in the field, and the the kind of the approach to immigration history that I was taught was that it's inherently sort of transnational, mm -hmm. um, and to understand the experience of immigrants in America, you have to look at where they're coming from and the ways in which they continue to be, you know, in, in touch with in some material way, their, their, their places of origin. Um, in some ways, I wanted to kind of take that approach from immigration history and kind of apply it to, you know, otherwise a pretty standard kind of narrative of the civil war, right? kind of looking at the sectional crisis in the civil war, not just from an Irish American point of view, but from a, a kind of transatlantic 
perspective that accounts for events uh, from Ireland uh, that kind of reverberate uh, across the Atlantic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, I think you, you do a great job of sort of illustrating that, that intellectual baggage that they're bringing that has been yeah. formed and formulated in Ireland over the years leading up to their immigration. Um, out of curiosity, did you have any like pushback from the, from the press or from the reviewer about this sort of approach or? Um... Not really, no. In fact, it was really, I guess the, feedback I got was to really emphasize um, yeah. the, the kind of transatlantic um, scope of the study. And in its first iteration as a dissertation um, that had kind of faded from view once I got to the to the war years where it really became much more concerned with events happening in in the US, you know, mm -hmm. home front and battlefield, right? And part of the process of turning it from a dissertation to a book really involved looking at the ways in which um, the continued kind of exchange of you know, information, ideas, people, money uh, between Ireland and America continued mm -hmm. through the war years and continued to shape the way that Irish Americans understood, viewed and took part in the, the, the debate and now conflict over slavery. So I think that was a kind of area where it initially probably wasn't as as pronounced as it is in the book now. Yeah, no, it, it's kind of curious where you were saying like this, this transatlantic Irish community, because that's, that's really what it is. It's, it's a, it's a group of people with the same ethnicity or nationhood, if you want, that lives on two sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I think there's even <laughs> beyond that, right? The kind of diasporic um, approach. Yeah. Kim McMahon's book on, on the Irish kind of global press and global Irish identity mm -hmm. um, was a really influential, you know, piece of scholarship that informed uh, this, my study. Um, who looks at how it's not just even transatlantic, it's truly a kind of diasporic sense yeah. of of uh, national identity that that emerged really mm -hmm. from the, the aftermath of the famine and, and built over the next several several decades. Um, right. So yeah, no, I, I think that it, it just made, especially just being in the source material, the way that Irish American newspapers are reporting on crop yields, ships departures, things of this nature back in Ireland, right? And then Irish newspapers are reporting on um, you know, debates over the fugitive slave law, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the kind of really, what we tend to oftentimes think of just these really internecine and partisan politics mm -hmm. of the sectional crisis are debated and interpreted and framed differently in, in Ireland, right? So I think that's what just allowed me to, to grasp that reality that this is a, a truly kind of, you know, transatlantic, you know, framework for in which Irish people took part in that, in that larger debate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that the other parts that sort of, sort of interesting right when you think about like you're you're looking at it from the perspective of abolition emancipation and the british are ahead of all of that but then right. there's also this notion of like daniel o'connell as sort of a liberator because he wants to brings catholic emancipation to to ireland and yeah so it's 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 an interesting situation because we we have sort of this Irish desire for emancipation from the British. And then you add this conversation about enslaved people in the Americas, British Empire and North America that are also of concern with regard to abolition now and as the end of enslavement. Sure. How how does the Irish kind of manage this sort of situation because of these two emancipations that they're looking at and desiring or in some cases not desiring i guess right right so how do you how do you distinguish between the the, the abolition of slavery um in so in some ways there's kind of three right there's british abolition yeah. and british emancipation right in which daniel o'connell like a leading irish nationalist plays in a, a key role it's where the origins of a, an organization I, I follow closely in the book, the Hibernian Anti-Slavery Society, really got their start looking at the aftermath of British emancipation and, and, and trying to think about the system of equitable system of labor in British colonies and its aftermath. So there's that piece. There's the, the piece of Catholic emancipation in Ireland. And if you could you know, push that forward, maybe, you know, um, uh, Irish freedom in right? a kind of more political sense, right? Yeah. But then there's also the debate over slavery and freedom in the United States. Mm -hmm. And Irish people are in various ways involved in all three of those um, because, you know, in some ways they're kind of between these two empires and of both these two Atlantic world empires. 
um, in, in, in various ways, right? Politically with Britain, economically with Britain, uh, through their mass emigration to the United States mm -hmm. and the kind of ways in which Irish Americans um, develop this kind of transatlantic identity and also actual nationalist movements to try to shape events in Ireland. So, yeah, I think that there is a kind of, there's three different questions of freedom or slavery, if you will, that Irish people are kind of involved with. And the, the book really focuses on not as much the, the, the kind of British case, aside from acknowledging that O'Connell's a part of it, right. the Hibernian Anti-Slavery Society is, emerges from it, but really looking at how the questions about the, the, the freedom of Ireland and what that would mean were just inherently intertwined with questions over about the future of slavery in America, right? And that you, that for Irish people, those they couldn't sort of disentangle those those two questions between the 1840s and, and the end of the Civil War. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I kind of was curious in terms of like how how these two are kind of like the languages of the repeal and abolition kind of intertwine with each other too, because it's like that that's sort of the the challenge right of like how how do you linguistically potentially try to distinguish between these two um yeah yeah and what was interesting to me and other historians have pointed this out and i kayla mcdaniel had a, a really a important article back in 2011 about this the way the garrisonian abolitionists tried to in fact in some ways adopted the language of daniel o'connell's repeal movement repeal of the in O'Connell's case, in the Irish case, it's repealing the Act of Union of 1801 mm -hmm. that had made Ireland uh, and, uh, politically integrated with the, the, the British Empire, right? There's no more sovereign Irish parliament because of that, that, that legislative act, right? And O'Connell's campaign to repeal it would have resulted in some type of Irish sovereignty, you know, the return mm -hmm. of a, an Irish parliament at the least uh, to Dublin. And Garrisonians point to that and say, we also want to repeal a union, right? We also were going to repeal this uh, detestable union with slaveholders and slavery that is, mm -hmm. is, is created through the constitution. Uh, and uh, for a time, try to use that kind of framing in a sense to kind of appeal to uh, Irish nationalists in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I think also prospective emigrants in Ireland who are part of O'Connell's repeal movement, but also Irish Americans in the United States who are already, of course, in, in America but are very closely following and in some ways contributing financially and rhetorically to the, to the repeal movement back in Ireland. And, you know, a good chunk of the first half of the book is looking at how, um, how that transatlantic abolitionist movement mm -hmm. tried, but ultimately failed to win over Irish and Irish American support by wedding together, this kind of the, the kind of cause for Irish freedom with the cause of, for, for black freedom. Okay, I have a question in mind, but the first thing yeah. I want to ask is, yeah. why do you think that is? Because a lot of people would probably be like, oh, it's racism in Ireland, but you kind of seem to indicate it's not that simple an answer. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, you know, this really in some ways goes back to like the the first argument, the book really makes two interrelated arguments. The one tries to tackle this really like age old paradox, at least going back to in scholarship, like the 1930s. You know, abolitionists are asking this question on the eve of the yeah. Civil War, basically, which is why why were Irish people who claimed to have been oppressed by landlords and British colonial authorities in Ireland, why are they taking the side of enslavers in the United States? And, you know, their answer is that it's it's uh, abolitionists say, well, they're just sort of embracing the kind of racist mm -hmm. uh, language, the racist uh, system of the United States in order to, you know, kind of fit in basically, right? Mm -hmm. And there's different scholarly explanations for this. There's labor competition, the fears of labor competition between newly freed people and Irish immigrant workers, right? There's the idea that it was the Roman Catholic hierarchy that opposed pretty much all forms of social reform movements in the mid 19th century, especially abolitionism. And then there's the idea that it was a political kind of influence, right? It was the pro-slavery democratic party welcoming in the Irish Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, counting, courting their vote. Uh, and of course, the Irish would then not be rocking the boat on, on the, the Democratic Party's position on slavery, right? And those are all relevant and I think, uh, part of the equation. But to, to get back to your question, right, what I argue in the book is that it's really 
not just in the United States where Irish American positions on slavery are formed. It, it, they take shape in Ireland mm -hmm. during uh, and leading up to and during the, the Great Irish Potato Famine. And what happens during that time is that a kind of certain segment of the Irish nationalist movement comes to see abolitionism as being just inimical to the interests of Irish people, both uh, socially and, and politically, right? And, and they come to conclude really at, at, early in the famine that abolitionism isn't just irrelevant to Irish people, but in fact, it's in some ways kind of, you know, oppositional to their, their interests. And that argument is kind of carried over across the Atlantic during the famine migration, including by some of those very same nationalists who are, are sent essentially into exile or flee Ireland in the aftermath of the, the, the failed 1848 rising there, right? And then it kind of it takes life from there, uh, but has really essential origins in Ireland uh, during during the, the early period of the famine years. Yeah, let, let's not go too far ahead with the yeah, sure. Ireland, yeah. Irish Confederation guys, yeah. because I, I do want to, I want to explore them quite a bit because it's a very fascinating story that you're pointing out with them coming over and kind of the impact on the Irish community. I wanted to stay yeah. to, in Ireland for a minute longer. Sure. Because... <clears throat> you already mentioned that the emergence of this Young Ireland movement, the Irish Confederation, is is really a key and sort of sort of the the divergence within Ireland between sort of abol in regard to abolition as sod. And one of the criticisms that the Young Ireland movement is always pointing at the O'Connells is that it's very heavily focused on Catholics, whereas they, yep. the Young Ireland movement tries to be more by um, non-sectarian. Secular, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, secular. So I, I kind of wondered, how much do we see maybe religious differences or also class differences in Ireland when it comes to this question of abolition? Um, I think it's class, the class component is, is uh, to me, the, the most important one. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you know, the, the vast majority of abolitionists in Ireland who are, no, I should emphasize, they're, they're few in number, right? They're um, urban folks, right? They're Dublin, uh, Belfast, Limerick, Cork, Galway, right? And yeah. um, they're dissenters. They're, uh, you know, Quakers, mm -hmm. um, Presbyterians, right? And the vast majority of the Irish population by this time is rural, Catholic, mm -hmm. and relatively impoverished, uh, you know, more or less, right? And in all these ways, they they are very different from the abolitionist movement. I think the one the one really Im important caveat there is that O'Connell was an abolitionist, right? And O'Connell is in, at the helm of the the repeal campaign, which has a mass following among the mm -hmm. rural Irish poor, right? Yeah. Through through you know what's called the repeal rent, where you can pay basically a penny per month uh, for kind of you know contributing to the the repeal campaign. And they set up these reading rooms across Ireland. Mm -hmm. That allows you to hear the news read to you of repeal, you know, organization minutes and, and meetings and whatnot. And so while the Irish abolitionists and the Hibernian Anti-Slavery Society have a really you know, hard time, I think, breaking through to the, the, the quote unquote masses. Right. Mm -hmm. O'Connell didn't. Right. O'Connell's speeches are read or heard by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Irish people in the early to mid 1840s. Um, including when Frederick Douglass, you know, spoke alongside you know, uh, O'Connell at a, at a, at a uh, repeal rally. And so that's where the Irish abolitionists thought they could m make inroads, right? There's uh, James Houghton is one of the co-founders of the Hibernian mm -hmm. Anti-Slavery Society. I found in his correspondence, he's urging O'Connell throughout the early to mid 1840s to just not give up on wedding together the cause of Irish freedom with the mm -hmm. cause of uh you know, black freedom, emancipation of slaves in the United States. Um, so there, I think there was a genuine possibility of, of that happening, right? In some, in some meaningful way. Um, it's, you know, counterfactual to say, well, if the famine hadn't happened, how might it have played out, right? But the famine, of course, did happen. And that's when, and we can maybe get into it more, that's when this kind of uh, faction of Irish nationalists known as Young Ireland really starts to make the argument that abolitionism is not just again irrelevant but really inimical to the the needs and the the interests of irish people yeah no actually that i well i was thinking about picking them up and like i mean if we were talking counterfactual i mean we could also yeah. kind of ask like what would have been the was the, the kind of pass of ireland if it hadn't been o'brien and 
others leading that 1848 revolution, but sure. some more competent people with better planning. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. Like, um, but no, I, I actually was. That's a great question, right? Of like what, like I, I, I kind of liked that you had this interesting line in the book there, and when I read it, I kind of was like. Well, it's sort of like, why should they care about people in another country when their own people in Ireland are starving, when they're trying to f gain independence? It's sort of like, like I'm playing devil's advocate, like, yeah. why should they not be selfish? Right. Um, and so that 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 argument, interestingly, it doesn't really come up until 1845. And O'Connell, you know, well, the repeal campaign starts in 1840. O'Connell is incessant in his kind of haranguing of Irish Americans who mm -hmm. you know, refuse to denounce slavery and, and, and pro-slavery apologists. As I discussed in the book, he threatens repeatedly to return donations that come with any sort of indication of, of you know, pro-slavery sentiments, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think he might have. It's not entirely clear mm -hmm. um, if he ever actually followed through on that. But young Ireland nationalists reached this point in 1845 where they say, okay, uh, enough is enough, right? That this is, especially in the context of what happens in 1845, which is, you know, Angie Murphy's book has shown, is, you know, the prospect of war now between yeah. Britain and America, yeah. right? With the annexation of yeah. Texas and, you know, the, the kind of the, the fallout from that. And O'Connell seems to be saying that his opposition to slavery will lead him to side with Britain in this, you know, potential conflict with the United States uh, over Texas, right? And for some of the young Ireland nationalists, this is, you know, kind of a bridge too far to go, right? That they say, basically, if if we're just going to be kind of taking the side of Britain here, then what are we what are we actually doing, especially if it's because of O'Connell's anti-slavery sentiments, which now this is really starting to weaken the, the, the cause of Irish sovereignty and, and not really respond to the needs of Irish people. Yeah, and it, it's like how much, like how much money are we talking about that comes from slave states? Because the the vast majority of the Irish migrant population is in yeah. in in New England and New York yeah. and the the midwestern parts of the country at this time. There, so you know, it's it's not just the fact that it's from slave states necessarily. During uh, the famine, there's uh, a couple of particular donations from Baltimore and, and Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And these are for famine relief. These aren't for, you know, Irish nationalist right. uh, organizations like the, the repeal movement. Right. And you know, the 1200 pounds, 1300 pounds for Irish famine relief. It's it's a drop in the bucket, I guess, in the grand scheme of the, the scale of relief from America. But O'Connell had been raising issues, not just with donations to the repeal movement from slave states, but also with like repealers in Cincinnati who, mm -hmm. you know, basically say, you know, we're not going to take sides with abolitionists, right? We, we support repeal, but this is not our, our fight. Uh, and and we're, we're not going to kind of join you in, in the, you know, taking the, taking up the cause of anti-slavery. Um, so it, you know, it's not just specific to, to donations from slave states, which are, as, as you point out, you know, relatively lesser in comparison with the really vast amounts of money coming from like New York, Boston, you know, Philadelphia, the, the major centers of Irish immigration up to the 1840s. Yeah, uh, and that's like, I guess usually we say beggars can't be choosers, but in, in this case, it's it, it almost feels yeah. like it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, 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 you know, so there's a newly published book uh, called Aiding Ireland. that does a really good job looking at the, the debates over Irish famine relief, not just between in the United States, in the South, uh, but also looking at places like England and uh, I think India, and oh, wow. uh, basically makes the case that when people are debating Irish famine relief, or I should say contributing to it, they're really trying to shape their own interests or advance their own interests that are you know localized, mm -hmm. right? So enslavers that donate to Irish famine relief do so not out of a genuine concern or humanitarian concern, right? But to show that they're benevolent, right. that abolitionist criticism of them are you know are baseless, right? And yeah. so that, that's in part that's what's happening there, or sort of the we're going to we're sympathetic to a oppressed people wanting to gain freedom that exactly probably came yeah. in there as well yeah um, yeah now of course yeah. then we get to the the beautiful moment where all these young ireland lightning rods let's call them for the moment 
start to come to the United States as yeah. in some cases refugees, exiles, or convicted felons. Yeah. Um, and we're talking like I think that's important to note, right? We're talking about a small group of people. There, there it's not like hundreds and thousands that were part of this movement. It's just dozens. Yeah. And they have this overblown impact on opinion in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, really outsized to um the the what they had done in Ireland to advance the cause of of Irish sovereignty or independence, right? Yeah. They have this miserably failed uh, rising in 1848, as you, you know, point out, a number of them are arrested and convicted of treason, treason felon. Um, some escape, right? Some end up in a, a penal colony in, in Van Diemen's land and then escape to America, right? So they kind of come in dribs and drabs between 1848 and they're kind of really building towards the arrival of John Mitchell, you know, late in 1853. But Mitchell, especially others, uh, Thomas Francis Mayer, um, you know, Michael Doheny, you know, others that come to, I think, through as, uh, as again, Keith McMahon has shown through the Irish American press, mm -hmm. really become the shapers of, of Irish uh, nationalist thought in America, right? That Irish nationalism in America um, is really going to look differently thanks to the influence of, of the young Ireland exiles than it had previously. And they make it more militant, more vehemently kind of, you know, uh, anglophobic, you know, you know, kind of blaming England, as John Mitchell does in, in his, his book, the, the Last Conquest of Ireland, blames England for uh, essentially creating genocide uh, or genocidal conditions in Ireland for all intents and purposes. And that becomes uh, the, the kind of motif of Irish American nationalism is this kind of uh, militancy, uh, Republican is a Republicanist thought that says, you know, just domestic sovereignty is not enough. There has to be a full and complete separation from Britain. There has to be a uh, revolution if, if that's what's mm -hmm. what it takes to, to do this. And you have all these Irish nationalist organizations that take shape in the 1850s and over the next several decades, really, that are based upon that line of thinking that is introduced by the, the Young Ireland exiles. I was just, as you were talking, thinking like, in, in part, it's fascinating that you have this small group of failed revolutionaries that has such an outsized, Im oversized impact. Is it, is it because they just, like, because you have this exile community here in the United States, is it because they're just seen as these failed freedom fighters that arrive in sort of a safe haven or is it because like the the other members of the repeal movement they don't have to flee they, they're staying in Ireland right. they're right. they're not having to leave they're continuing the fight within the system against British oppression if you like so there yep. there is no op intellectual opposition in the United States to them that gives them a sort of an open field in which they can operate not to mention that yeah. they're having these hero welcomes. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, that's, and it is important to point out, right, that there are young islanders, some of whom initially escape uh, or flee, um, who do return to Ireland and don't mm -hmm. sort of, you know, take up this kind of more militant Republican form of nationalism. They they decide, <laughs> they embrace a kind of constitutional nationalism. Um, and you know, basically working within the, the 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 framework of the British Empire in order to seek greater domestic autonomy for Ireland, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, kind of this is like pushing forward a bit, but interestingly, that faction will be most likely to support the Confederacy or or oppose you know the 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 Union war effort, uh, the the you know especially Irish participation in it during the Civil War. But I guess going back to the young Irelanders in America, I think it's it's in part. Going back to this, uh, the classic study of Irish uh, immigration is Kirby, Kirby Miller's Immigrants and Exiles. It goes mm -hmm. you know, way back several decades now, but it still remains the, the best kind of macro kind of interpretation of, of understanding Irish immigration. And, and basically he says that kind of Irish culture, Irish peasant culture was kind of predisposed to see emigration as a type of, of uh, unwilling exile, even mm -hmm. if it was done by the individual for rational, you know, kind of uh, socioeconomic chances of yeah. betterment, right? Mm 
there was still this kind of cultural motif that held that, you know, emigration was banishment, was exile. And so yeah. for young Irelanders to kind of draw upon or call upon that kind of cultural reference point, I think was had, you know, of course, a, a lot of appeal for many folks who might have actually been doing quite well, perhaps, right? Um, mm -hmm. Others, of course, who aren't doing well can look at that and say, well, it's because we had been held down uh, in Ireland, right, that we aren't able to, to sort of make it here, right? Um, and there's a lot of appeal in this notion that, you know, it's not your fault, basically, that you've been kind of cast out by the cruel right. hand of, of British oppression. Uh, and if you want revenge, then here's here's a, a program for you, right? It kind of has some overtones that sound familiar to today, perhaps, right? Um, so I think they, they call upon that cultural reference point for what, uh, what Irish immigrants understood their um, yeah. their movement to have been. Yeah, sort of that yeah. they ask for our kind of personality yeah. that you mentioned personality earlier. You mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So, but I, I actually wondered yeah. about uh, something else too, because when you, because this is a, the, the, the young Ireland guys are dropping into the United States as a very, volatile moment in the United States politically, right? We have the realignment yep. politically. We have the demise of the Whig Party. We we have them located primarily in New England, Philadelphia, New York, Boston New York, yeah. cities, which as a result becomes a base for the American Party and nativism. And yep. that eventually, of course, becomes part of the Republican Party. So they align initially was the Democratic Party. So how's just sort of also location where they are, political environment where they are kind of aligning them with sort of the party of, for for kind of simplicity purposes, the party of slaveholders? Yeah. Yeah, so of course, I, you know, I think I said earlier, right, this is, you know, been one of the kind of previous explanations in scholarship is that it makes sense in a certain way for Irish immigrants, either young Isle, young island or exiles, or you know, your just kind of average common laborer mm -hmm. that is courted by the Democratic Party to kind of toe the party line in a basic sense, right? And and not willingly rock the boat at a time, as you point out, is it like nativism is coursing through American politics, right? The Know Nothing Party, just as John Mitchell arrives in 1853 and 54. The know nothings are are you know gaining traction across you know big segments of, of, of northern politics, yeah. um, and so in that environment, in that context, it makes a certain kind of political sense that mm -hmm. you would kind of fall in line with where the Democratic Party was on the question of slavery and its expansion. Um, I do. It's interesting, right? Is that when Irish young Islanders, in particular, when they start writing about as they do in in one of the many newspapers they come to own or edit or contribute to in some form, right? They talk about the political divisions in America as mirroring some of the divisions within Irish nationalist politics that they had mm -hmm. hoped to have kind of left behind, right? So just to, just to give one example, in 1849 and 50, the, the Irish temperance leader, uh, Father Theobald Matthew, comes to America on this tour um, to try to win over Irish Americans and native born Americans to the cause mm -hmm. of temperance, right? William Lloyd Garrison goes to visit him in Boston because back in 1841, Matt, Father Matthew had signed uh, an address uh, kind of led by Daniel O'Connell to Irish Americans, calling them to join with the abolitionists in America, right? And Garrison hopes, well, if you can get Father Matthew to um, renew this, this call for Irish Americans to join the abolitionist cause, they'll have some, he'll have some clout, maybe better than, than Garrison himself could do. Matthew refuses. It becomes this whole sort of, you know, a politically charged affair that's covered first in Garrison's Liberator, then it's picked up upon all across uh, the country. And in Irish American newspapers, they say, look, this is the same thing that was happening to us back during the repeal years, right? I'm um, thinking of one editorial in particular that says this is the, the first, the very first causes of divisions within repeal was over this kind of pernicious issue of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, we really just need to kind of shunt this aside. And in this case, focus on Father uh, Matthew's efforts to aid and uplift the Irish in America through the cause of temperance, right? And then very quickly after to 
keep together the union amidst the, the crisis of 1850, right? So all to say, right, that while there is this kind of, you know, clearly American, clear influence of uh, distinctively American politics that exerts itself on young Islanders and other Irish American figures, there's also ways in which they, they continue to kind of understand that the sequence of events that are playing out in the early mid 1850s as mirroring or in some ways, you know, having been shaped by their, their backgrounds in Ireland. Well, yeah, and I think that's the, the part that I kind of always find interesting, of course, in, in part what the South, when it comes to secession, talks about is sort of the right for self-governance, right? And right. that's definitely right. appealing to Irish because it's like, they would be like, oh, yeah, we have argued that for for decades now, too. So, yeah, we, we understand what you're talking about. So there's relational kind of similarities that they can, I guess, see sure. in it. Sure. And, you know, Irish editorialists, editors, I should say, back in Ireland, especially, the, as I mentioned, the kind of constitutional nationalist faction, um, uh, the, the, the nation continues to exist as a newspaper, the Freeman's Journal in Ireland and mm -hmm. in, in, in Dublin, kind of really comes out very clearly on the side of, of the Confederacy and says this is just a, a, a movement to assert the right to self-government that we, the Irish people, are also seeking to assert for ourselves in our political relationship with, mm -hmm. with you know, the, the, the British Empire. Um, you know, some uh, some Irish Americans in the northern states also kind of flirt with this, like famously Thomas Francis Mayer, you know, initially is kind of hesitant, uh, mm -hmm. at least it's written about that he's a little hesitant to embrace the mm -hmm. Union war effort, um, very kind of quickly sheds that hesitancy. Um, but yeah, I think there's, it, there's a certain logic by which Irish people on both sides of the Atlantic see the cause of the Confederacy is one being predominantly about self-governance, national determination, if you will, right? Especially because in the, the Union states, you know, initially, of course, there, there's no urgent calls for emancipation to make this a war about slavery, uh, at least, you know, from the Lincoln administration, right? So they, they can kind of somewhat dishonestly see say what you this want is to not see. a war about slavery. Yeah, you kind of yeah. see what you want to see there. Uh, before we get exactly. to the war, though, I, I wanted to briefly sure. ask about, um, because you mentioned it now a few times, newspapers. How, like, we, yeah. we have a, for those that are not familiar, there's a very strong print culture in the United States that is oftentimes ethnically influenced, that ethnic groups have sort of their own newspapers, especially if they can maintain those with a large immigration population, which in the Irish case there is. Sure. So... I think you mentioned that you were primarily looking at three Irish newspapers in the New York area. Um, was that like because those were like the mouse pieces of Irish like public opinion or these were the shapers of or were these different views that you found were going to be beneficial for your work or why is it? Yeah, no. So I looked at... um a number but really four that i read basically from start to finish you know starting in like 18 you had a microfilm so, poisoning yeah no i spent a lot of time just you know on the microfilm reader for about a year and a half doing this um back issue still still around from that but so it's, it's the boston pilot which you know has been for a long time seen as the kind of the the, the most influential most widely read Irish American newspaper of the, the the 19th century. It's nicknamed at its time the, the Irishman's Bible, right? It's got uh, I think at its peak around a hundred thousand subscribers, readers, right? So and more than that, readers, I should say, because of its being passed around and shared, yeah. right? Um, that it's just simply the most widely read uh, Irish American newspaper. The um, New York Freeman's Journal, edited by ironically not an Irish American, James McMaster. Uh, is uh, a kind of mouthpiece for the, the Roman Catholic hierarchy in New York mm. City. And so that seemed to be really a key, you know, a, a key you know, source to kind of include to kind of get an uh, Irish American Catholic kind of lens into the into the, the events mm. that I was tracking. The New York Irish American is a uh, paper edited and owned by a kind of a succession of young Ireland exiles in New York mm. City. And is this kind of more, you know, non-sectarian um irish crazy paper. Point of, uh, what's that the crazy guy's paper 
Yeah, right. And um, interesting, I mean, gets into all sorts of disputes with both the pilot yeah. and the Freeman Journal over kind of doctrinal issues and to, to what extent should Irish nationalism be a Catholic movement, right? Um, kind of like I, the nation know, again, in Ireland was. Exactly, yeah. And then the, the Cincinnati Telegraph and Gazette, it goes through a couple of name changes in, in, in the period I'm, I'm looking at it, is um, owned and edited by the, the Purcell brothers, uh, you know, mm -hmm. both uh, Catholic clerics. One's the Archbishop of Cincinnati, I think it is. Um, and uh, kind of looking for a more Western, you know, kind of trans-Appalachian, I guess, point of view, because, you know, you do have a sizable Irish-American mm -hmm. population in, in the old Northwest, right? Cincinnati, cities like Toledo, of course, Chicago, um, you know, other kind of smaller, you know, kind of growing uh, semi-industrial uh, cities out there. Um, that's really the kind of the, the representative, I think, one of the a good representative kind of voice for the Irish American viewpoint in the West. No, oh, and and print media is important during this period, and it it gives yeah. us it's sort of a gauge to public opinion in many ways. Oh. Yeah, and I think it's I mean what was most useful to me is the fact that they're all arguing with each other. Right? They, mm -hmm. they print and reprint each other's editorials. Yeah. Heavy volume of of letters to the editor. And there's, you know, it's nice. it, it's it's a kind of open dialogue, essentially, right? It's not just, of course, you know, it's not just factual reporting. Um, that might be the least important part of them, right? Is it's really kind of uh, a, a means of, you know, voicing differing viewpoints and different interpretations of of what's happening, and especially politically. Yeah, and that made it that much yeah, more interesting. So, right. so the war. To the war, yeah, um, and I, I, this was a really interesting part because, right as you point out, John uh, Thomas Francis Mayer being initially very, very lukewarm on the cause of the Union, and then uh, lukewarm on the cause of emancipation. But you you kind of follow in the footsteps of a lot of scholarship with regard to soldiers going to war, then sort of seeing, seeing the reality on the ground, and sort of becoming what what I want to call you a practical abolitionist. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess to to kind of set up how that occurs and, and why um folks who had in some cases very loudly spoken out against abolitionism led mobs to break up abolitionist mm -hmm. meetings in some cases that I, I I study in the book, right? Yeah. You have to understand how prior to the war and really almost in some ways amping up during it, there's this kind of Irish American unionist um, ideology, you know, set of ideas that mm -hmm. kind of goes hand in hand initially with, with an Irish American critique of anti-slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Irish American unionists see the union as a haven for immigrants, especially those who are, you know, enduring oppression, uh, you know, economic calamity in, in Europe. They see it as a place where immigrants can find uh, religious and political liberty that is is unavailable to them in Europe or in specifically in Ireland. And unique to Irish Americans, of course, is the, the the hope, and I think you know for some a very tangible prospect that America will be Ireland's ally in the cause of Irish mm -hmm. freedom. Right. So these are the reasons why you would want a robust politically, uh, economically thriving United States, right? Because it can take in, you know, the, the, the kind of quote unquote refugees of, of Europe. It can um, ensure them economic, political, religious uh, prosperity and, and, and uh, safety. And it can serve as an exemplar, if not an actual like military ally to would be nationalists or revolutionaries uh, back in Europe, in Ireland in particular, right? And it seems like that goes hand in hand in the antebellum period with a kind of anti-abolitionist uh, kind of critique, which is that, well, abolitionism, really by the time of the 1850s, it's, it's kind of anti-slavery writ large, mm -hmm. is dividing the country. This is the argument that Irish-American unionists make uh, and doing so in a way that does it a disservice that is, again, just like it had been in Ireland, it's now inimical to the interests of Irish-American people. So... You know, leading into the war, that's those two things go hand in hand, right? Irish American uh, critique of anti-slavery seems to fit nicely with this Irish American unionist strain of thought, and 
you know, for reasons we can maybe get into how this unfolds kind of on the ground, the the dynamics of war, you know, unanticipated outcomes of war on the ground, just completely, not completely, but for many, just uh, really call into question the notion that acting in the interests of protecting and even expanding slavery is acting in, inter in the interests of the union, right? If you now have this rebellion that's being waged, as folks come to understand that are in this, you know, marching through the South, seeing enslaved people, you know, coming into their lines, not just to secure their freedom, but also provide them with military intelligence and of working in their union encampments, right? It very quickly starts to cause one to question, all right, are we really serving the interests of unionism by trying to protect the institution of slavery? Uh, that that is very clearly now on the side of of breaking up the union. Yeah, no, and I I was actually thinking because that's again it's a very pragmatic kind of approach. There's that you yeah. it's a man are taking. It also sort of means that we're not overcoming sort of racial perspe perceptions about African American, right? It's sort of like yeah, because I see your emancipation now as a war goal that will shorten the war by weakening the South doesn't mean I, I believe you're equal to me or that you should have the same rights as me. Um, sure. And I think in, in that way, right, Irish Americans who come to embrace emancipation very much mirror a pretty wide swath of the, the general kind of, yeah. you know, northern populace, right? Um, I do find, you know, the, the, the book tries to make the point that there are varying degrees of enthusiasm with which, mm -hmm. you know, Irish Americans come to, you know, embrace the, the demise of slavery and want to actively contribute to it, right? There are instances I find where you, you I think you find something of a, a genuine kind of humanitarian revulsion mm -hmm. at, at slavery when, when Irish American soldiers encounter it, you know, in reality, when they encounter enslaved people especially uh, and find themselves driving the same wagon together in the case of like a, a teamster, a black teamster that's um, driving the wagon of this, this Irish American editorialist who's writing letters back to the New York Irish American. And there's that on the one hand, right? But then there's other times where it's a matter of simply, well, I have to do this because I'm a soldier and I have to obey orders. And if the orders now include enforcing the Emancipation Proclamation, then I'm, I'm going to do that, right? So there, it, there's a pretty wide spectrum in terms of how eager, how enthusiastic um, Irish Americans are in, in in their their um, embrace of emancipation. I think really importantly, though, they wouldn't have done so. I say, you know, kind of crit at a critical mass, if it had not been for kind of the continued evolution of of a, you know the relationship between Ireland and America during the war. No, and I, I mean we could go down the Fenians and kind of the Irish Republican Brotherhood as well, and kind of sing and like how that. Yeah. that that group influences viewpoints but in part of two because you have so many you bring out so many different voices in the chapters with regard to the civil war that kind of talk about yeah. like that what's the kind of like the training of of irish soldiers for the future conflicts going in britain sort of the changing of attitude towards slavery and emancipation but i also kind of was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on sort of the notion of like how much how much was some of this change in sinking officers versus the average soldier, yeah. which of course is very hard to get to because the average soldier oftentimes sure. doesn't leave us the, the records that we would like to kind of gauge their kind of their right. interest and ideas. Yeah. And no, I think obviously, right. The lot of ink been spilled on the, the, the common soldier of the civil war and, you know, the, 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 Kind of perils of relying upon soldiers' letters that overrepresent mm -hmm. better educated, more affluent um, soldiers, oftentimes officers, right? Um, I, you know, I, I don't find that to be the uh, necessarily a, a problem, though, because in some ways I'm looking at, well, who are the, the influential figures in Irish America who could serve as kind of, you know, models or, you know, uh, folks that others would look to and say, okay, well, if Thomas Francis Mayer is now stumping on behalf of Lincoln in 1864, you know, that's that's significant, right? He's, as we talked about, right? The young Irelanders have this kind of clout with Irish Americans. Yeah. And as mayor, others uh, speak out on behalf of emancipation, 
uh, for the Lincoln administration later in the war. Yeah, I find that to be a, you know, a, a key development and there's no telling how much that trickles down to the kind of, you know, the rank and file in the army to, you know, common laborers in the streets of, of New York, right? And there's good evidence to suggest in New York, certainly, that it didn't, right? Because you have the draft riots. Yeah, we're going to get to know, whether it's, <laughs> Yeah, sure. But whether it's whether it's officers like like Mayor and others, you know, at the at the more junior level, whether it's, you know, prominent Catholic clerics, Irish American newspaper editors, um, Irish American nationalists who don't necessarily serve in the Union Army, but kind of, you know, remain influential kind of on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those, as I look at it in the last chapter, these kind of influential figures that give arguments for emancipation, I think are really important to kind of take note of. And there's kind of like dribs and drabs of evidence that, mm -hmm. you know, there's letters from the a, a, a private soldier in Massachusetts, for instance, about how he read an, an O'Connell speech from 1843 in the, the Wheeling Intelligencer, and that he's sending it along to a, another buddy in the army, right? So you, you see this kind of little small signs that that discourse at the top is kind of filtering down below to some degree, and I think especially within Irish Americans in the army. Yeah, no, I mean, that's makes total sense that the officers talk about things and the soldiers start to pick up on it. Um, draft riot. That is a very yeah. big, big part of your book. And a, I guess we can easily say one of the linchpins of misinterpreting Irish attitudes towards race, right? Yeah, and I, I guess I, I, I try to state, and I don't want to downplay and, and you know, uh, de-emphasize the, the significance of the, the draft riots and, and what they kind of tell us about um racism in America, Irish American mm -hmm. uh, racism in particular, right? But what I what I found in researching for the book is a, a substantial body of evidence that there is a kind of a, a kind of counter narrative of Irish American mm -hmm. involvement and then reactions to the draft riots. That there are uh soldiers in the Union Army who are writing to their officers uh, and petitioning to be sent to New York to take part in, in kind of subduing the rioters. That was There's, um, you know, a kind of a, a history of Irish American Catholic clerics that are providing shelter and protection to, you know, black New Yorkers who are fleeing mm -hmm. this kind of pogrom of violence initiated by Irish born wage laborers primarily. Um, and then, you know, for the, in the months that follow from this, there are these really um, vehement denunciations of the, the draft rioters from Irish American soldiers, from Irish American newspaper editors, um, clerics continue to kind of condemn uh, the, the rioters all across. Catholic clerics continue to condemn the riots in, in the months that, that follow from it. So to me, this kind of represents not necessarily, you know, it's the draft riots are oftentimes framed as kind of this, this like brutal coda to mm -hmm. the, the history of Irish American um, involvement in the debate over slavery and really is in some ways as a, as a pivotal moment in, in race relations in America, right? That you, this is, is a, a signal for the white working class uh, to, to, to indicate their, their brutal hostility to the, the black freedom, right? Hmm. And that's true. At the same time, there's this kind of, as I said, kind of a counter narrative that emerges in the aftermath of really during the riots, but especially afterwards, that I just wanted to kind of just call attention to, because I think it helps to explain why in the two years after the riots, you still have Irish Americans serving in the Union Army, speaking on behalf of the Union war effort, and you know, in some ways, continuing to come out in favor of emancipation, you know, by, you know, two years later after July 1863. Yeah, and I, I just was looking because you had like these, like two Irish officers who are actually being attacked yeah. by the by the mob. So it's sort of like it's, it it's almost a little bit of an Irish internal civil war happening there in, in New York City. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. So I'm not sure it's um, the right uh, to, way to go with that, but no. But I think it's I, you know I, I call attention to it because I think the the way that these incidents happen is, is revealing, right? So one mm -hmm. is this Colonel Hugh O'Brien, is a New York uh, officer of a New York regiment. He's sent home to try to recruit to you know refill the, the depleted ranks of his his unit, and um, while he's in New York, the draft riots break out, right? And he basically you know is, is steps up to say, yeah, I'll take my recruits will help to kind of restore order in the streets. Um, he's 
at the helm of this detach, you know, detachment of Union soldiers that really brutally fire, you know, suppresses the rioters. They, they supposedly kill s- several innocent bystanders, uh, including a, a, an infant child who's looking on from a window. And uh, later on the, the day, O'Brien finds that his house has been ransacked. Uh, he kind of, you know, goes back to his neighborhood and finds this crowd awaiting him. He brazenly steps into a, a drugstore to, to seek out supposedly something to drink. And he's set upon by this mob. And, and you know, the descriptions are just vivid in the kind of gory detail with what they, they do to this guy. And it mirrors the exact same type of kind of, you know, treatment that they give in the, the worst cases to black New Yorkers who are, are you know, really brutally set upon by the, the mobs that are, are roaming the streets. Um, and so I think that that's significant, right? They see Hugh O'Brien in some ways, right? Not to overemphasize that point, but as being part and parcel with the black New Yorkers who who come to represent the, the detested policy of emancipation, this war for emancipation that, you know, wage laborers are now you know being conscripted into, allegedly. The other guy is Colonel Robert Nugent. He is an officer in the Irish Brigade. He is recovering from an injury and he's uh, the provost marshal in New York City who's basically tasked with carrying out uh, conscription in New York City on the day of the riots, right? So you can understand that the mob would see him as someone to to take issue with. They visit his apartment, they go in and they ransack it, right? Loot it. But they, interestingly, they they take away a sword that he'd been gifted by Mayor Thomas Francis Mayer as a gift, Hmm. uh, as a fellow Irish brigade officer. And they also destroy a picture, uh, a picture of him and Mayer together, right? So they kind of are very consciously targeting these symbols like material mm. symbols of the irish participation in the union war effort right um so that that to me was just telling right that these are this is maybe not a civil war right but a clearly a recognition that there are fundamentally conflicting you know perspectives among irish americans on the union war effort by this point in, in 1863 i and i i will say that <laughs> i'm i'm impressed based on what you said because in your book you say quote beaten to death over the course of six hours for O'Brien, which is sort of like, yeah. I, 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 I can't even fathom like how it takes somebody six hours to yeah. be beaten to death. <laughs> like, yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's insane. I, I think I left out some of the goriest details. Thankfully. Kind of excessive. Yeah. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's yeah. horrific. Right. Um, yeah. But in it, the it, same it, manner that, Hundreds of Black New Yorkers are, you know, yeah. and oftentimes mutilated. Right? They they yeah. do the same thing to this this Irish-born colonel. Yeah, and I kind of wondered as I was reading it, how much, because you have here Irish people in the U.S. Army saying, "That's not us, and we're willing yeah. to fight this," and subdue so these fellow Irishmen who are rising up against the draft, <clears throat> and trying to prevent us from ending this war. So you have this duality of two Irish groups. And I kind of wondered, because this is New York, after all, how much yeah. does that impact the community long term? Because does this sort of leave like, like in the United States, we we know that the Civil War leaves massive reconciliation problems between North and South and veterans don't ever really forgive each other for what's going on. How sad in the Irish community? Do the Irish yeah. soldiers come back to New York and it's sort of like it it's it it it's in the past, or is this sort of like Irish soldiers come no. back to New York and are like, you were in the draft riot, you're a troublemaker. Yeah. No, so I mean, um in the short term, uh, you know, like the Irish Brigade coming back to New York late in 1863, early 1864, again to kind of you know, re- refill their, their really depleted ranks by this point in time. And whereas when the core unit of the Irish Brigade, the 69th of New York, had been one of the, the, the initial three-month regiments of the war in 1861, they returned and got the heroes welcome. Uh, the, the New York Irish Brigade units got all these kind of hero send-offs back in 1861 and 62. When they come back in 1864, it's kind of just a whole lot of nothing uh, among New Yorkers. Um, they have their own kind of reception and, and banquet in which they more or less acknowledge that they are not necessarily shunned, but it's not the same kind of, you know, celebratory air about it that it had been, you know, two or three years earlier when they went off to the war. Um, you know, the, the long term is a question I don't explore too much in the book in New York City, at least. Uh, Susanna Bruce is you know, really 
uh, outstanding study of Irish Americans in the Civil War era, the Harp and the Eagle, kind of covers uh, Irish American memory of the Civil War and how Irish Americans kind of consciously constructed this history of loyal, you know, meaning of service during the war and the, and the decades that followed, I, you know, very much covering over the involvement in the draft riots, not just in New York City, but of course, you know, you know, opposition to the draft and conscription all across the, the Union states. Um, so I think that was very much the case in, in New York as well, right? You will have certain figures that are held up mm -hmm. as model, you know, models for Irish Irish immigrants in the future to kind of follow by. Um, but the, the, the draft riots do have this lingering memory among New Yorkers and even kind of national figures like uh, Thomas Nass, right? So Thomas Nass mm -hmm. political cartoons through the 1870s will oftentimes feature, if you look closely kind of in the background, the Colored Orphans Asylum in New York City kind of mm -hmm. burning to the ground or, you know, a kind of uh, apishly depicted Irish immigrants murdering Black people in the streets as a kind of symbol of, you know, the, the, the kind of the copperhead Irish uh, kind of uh, involvement in, 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 in opposing conscription and emancipation. Yeah. All right. We are at, I think, just over an hour. So at this stage, I want to briefly yeah. talk about John Mitchell. Because sure. he is just such a such a wonderful lightning rod when it comes to Irish studies during the American Civil War period. So, yeah. in like two or three sentences, what's your opinion on John Mitchell? And then we can go into details. Sure. So he, as we talked about earlier, he is, I think, the, the, the key figure in the reinvention of Irish American nationalism. Right. It's it's through his writings, um, there are a couple of different books that he publishes in the 1850s and 60s that we get this articulation of grievance against Britain for the famine, the idea that the famine was intentionally famously says, you know, God Almighty sent the potato blight, but England created the famine, right? Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, right? So Massachusetts is one of only, I think, a couple of states where you're taught about the Great Irish Potato Famine as an act of genocide uh, and comparable to like the Armenian genocide, right? So this oh, <laughs> in Massachusetts, this has a very long life, right? Um, and I think he, more than any other uh, young Ireland exile, refashioned Irish American nationalism, but I don't think, I think we've kind of erred in looking at him as representative mm -hmm. of Irish American uh, views on slavery and slavery's future in America during the Civil War era. Guilty I as can charged. expand on that if you like, or yeah. No, I'll take guilty as charged in that case, since I did use him in <laughs> liberty and slavery quite a little bit um, as sort of a southern representation of Irish. Um, so Irish I Irish. think that's it's telling, right? That he has this famous incident in 1854, where in response to an Irish abolitionist, James Houghton, who seemed to in America denounce slavery, joined the abolitionists. Uh, Mitchell writes back and infamously says, you know, not only will we not do this, but he wishes for a well, a plantation in Alabama well stocked with, you know, black slaves and uses different terminology that's yeah, much more yeah. vulgar, right? Um, and, you know, folks have pointed that and said, well, that's, that's the Irish American point of view, right? Yeah. It's telling you that Mitchell, very soon after that, ends up moving down to Tennessee and then from there on to Virginia. Uh, the Citizen, his newspaper in New York City, where he publishes this letter to Hutton, loses, in his own words, tens of thousands of subscribers in like the drop of a, 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 a drop of a hat, right, after he publishes this letter. And again, in the book, what I try to show is that just like there is a kind of counter narrative to the draft riots, there's a counter narrative to Mitchell's Alabama plantation letter, where young Ireland nationalists in America denounce him, say, you know, I'm with Mitchell all the way, except here. Some explicitly say, you know, Irish nationalists should never be found on the side of the oppressor, right? Uh, I'm trying to think, of, I think it's Michael Doheny says this really more or less directly. Um, and, you know, other Irish Americans writing at the time, newspaper editorialists especially, but even kind of, you know, ordinary folks who you make their, are, are, are made plain in letters, they say, you know, Mitchell lost a good deal of his influence by coming mm -hmm. out so stridently in support of slavery, right? So I think that's, that's telling of where Irish Americans as a whole were. Right, that they are anti-abolitionists in the antebellum period, but they're not the same type of like militant pro-slavery 
that many abolitionists at the time, and, and you know, some folks in kind of in a long body of scholarship afterwards have kind of assumed them to be. Yeah, and I, I mean, Mitchell had always a history of putting his foot in his mouth, right? I mean, that's sure. like that's yeah. why why they kicked him out at the nation, right? Where he went got yeah. tried in Ireland, so that him coming to the United States shouldn't surprise us that he does something very similar again, <laughs> which. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, then you have this whole like, like I mean, when you think of his history, right? Then he joins the Irish Revolutionary Brotherhood, goes to Europe, but comes back to like side with the Confederacy and write for a yeah. Richmond paper. Has two sons that yeah, two, two sons yeah. that moved their life. Yeah. And he criticizes Davis's government as not like revolutionary yeah. enough. So he's he's just this yeah. he's this odd character in in so many regards. Um, that yeah. Um, it, it, Infamously, you know, argued for reopening the transatlantic slave trade, you know, just on the the the, the war too, right? So yeah, I, well, and I, again, I don't want to minimize. I think that there is a certain segment of Irish America prior to the Civil War that mm -hmm. you know maybe wouldn't have gone as far as Mitchell in these ways. Certainly didn't voice it publicly, but probably sympathized with them and was certainly as you know vehemently anti-abolitionist mm -hmm. as he was, right? And then shared his views on abolitionists as being foolish you know kind of extremists uh who, who you know ignored as, as mitchell charged ignored poverty in, in their own backyard be it in ireland or in america uh, i think that's a very widely shared viewpoint among irish americans just as it had been i think among the young islanders back in ireland during the famine yeah and considering i'm just thinking garrison was spoke out against mitchell quite a bit and i want i want to say it was in garrison's paper where wasn't it a suggestion that Mitchell should hang himself or go back to Ireland because of the things he had said about slavery? Um, it, I don't know. I don't know about that one, but I know that like Henry Ward Beecher's newspaper, the, the, I think it's the Brooklyn Independent, I think it was, basically says in the aftermath of Mitchell's Alabama plantation letter, if, if this was the the uh, tree that was sprouting in Ireland, we should tear it out root and stem, basically, yeah, right? Yeah. And for Irish Americans, this is bad because. Like this is how Americans and you know a growing segment of anti-slavery Americans will come to see Irish nationalists. This you know threatens their prospective support for the cause of Irish nation. Yeah, but I was thinking also in regard to like the argument of your book because that's very much encapsulates sort of what you're what you're saying. This sort of dilemma in in regard to abolition, right? Of like, yeah. should we embrace abolition? Should we not embrace abolition? And you have these Irish national, young Irish nationalists like Mitchell who are like, no, it's not our cause. It doesn't matter. And um, the only focus we have is our independence, not not what happens in this U.S. house. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that um, in a certain sense, even those Irish who come to embrace emancipation during the war, as they argue, do so not again for any sort of you know uh humanitarian sentiment uh, out of some sort of moral conviction that enslaving african americans is wrong but to go back to the kind of mitchellite perspective right because what is most paramount is aiding the cause of irish freedom the best way to do that now is to you know just uh, eliminate the root cause of this conflict that is preventing americans and irish americans from from, from doing it. yeah and um so yeah, it's... how about Mayor? He's also young Mayor, Irelander, so... but he's not as yeah. he's not as crazy as Mitchell. In a certain sense, no, right? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, he, you know, Mayor's a, a, he, he drowns a in Minute Montana, so I guess he's as crazy right. as Mitchell. Yeah, you know, so Mayor's he's a compelling figure to me. That's I think there's a, a recent biography of him biography of him, Timothy Egan's The Immortal Irishman, that I think, you know, in some ways tried to resurrect Mayer a little bit, um, and I think mm -hmm. for, the, for the better. Um, I'm generally kind of in, in, in agreement with his, his interpretation of, of Mayer's life and, and career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mayer's a braggart, and he's kind of very, you know, very loquacious, you know, silver tongue to the point of kind of, you know, um, of just being all talk, for lack of a better phrase, uh, in, in, in the eyes of some contemporaries and in the eyes of, of a number of historians, uh, you know, up until quite recently, I think. Um, 
you know, he's got an unsavory reputation in some respects. He's alleged to be a drunkard, um, alleged to drink while in, in command on, on the battlefield in, in a number of occasions. And of course, you know, leaves his wife and child in Ireland, basically kind of abandons them uh, while, while in exile. Um, never really made an effort to kind of re re reunite with them. But I think that he's he's someone that you know, he spoke in the, the vocabulary of his time in a way that was, you know, maybe more elegant than than many other Irish Americans, but that was uh, in a basic sense understood by them, right? This, this, the the, the um, arguments he makes in 1863, 64, for why Irish Americans, and he more or less says this, have to admit they were wrong about the need to preserve the union by acting in the interest of enslavers um, and need to embrace emancipation because that is the cause of, he says in the letter, all true Republicans, a, a lowercase r, not, not the, the, the formally of Republican Party, right? If you are a Republican, someone interested in the, the preservation and expansion of Republican democracy, mm -hmm. then you need to understand now that this, this, this project is only possible with the elimination of slavery from the United States because a, the, the country cannot go on as it is. Right? It's going to be just continuously di divided and at war with each other. But B, Marr comes to kind of recognize, I think, that there is a kind of moral stain on uh, the American Republic from slavery. And that removing that stain will thereby aid the, the broader cause of kind of Republican government around the world. And you know, I think he's, he's genuine in that. I also think he sees it directly as being applicable to, to Ireland first and foremost. Um, so, yeah, I think... I, I tend to kind of have a, a, you know, a more favorable position on, you know, interpretation of Mars, um, loquaciousness maybe than, than other folks have. Um, but I, I do think that he's someone that maybe has, has been written off in a certain way that is worth kind of re-looking at now. Yeah, no, I, I agree yeah. that he's a very, very fascinating figure and I, I enjoyed researching for my book. So I, I hope others will, will give him some attention, but, um, as the last question, I'm going to throw you a little curveball because you're a historian of Irish people in the in the United States. I have to dabbled a little bit in that. All right, after a small technical delay, as you can see, Ian is now on a little different perspective with us. Uh, I'm going to want to ask our last question for today, and that is considering how much work has been done on the Irish. And this is the Irish during the American Civil War, military studies, political studies, the Fenians. There's so many books. Where do we go from there? Like what what's the un, unwritten page in the history of the Irish, especially in the United States, Ian? Yeah, so I mean <laughs> It, it is a field where it might be hard for you know dissertation students now to find the 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 unwritten part of of uh, Irish American history at the very least. And I think you know the the field of Irish studies has really moved recently towards a more as I mentioned I think a little bit earlier a kind of diasporic mm -hmm. framework, looking at the the kind of connectivity between different nodes of of the Irish diaspora and um you know how the how that diaspora and those connections took shape over time how they changed over time and you know looking at how localized contexts right the irish in australia or south africa or you know canada or, or america how those localized contexts um shaped irish communities while at the same time those communities themselves remained kind of part of this larger diasporic um, network uh, and had some so, uh, a diasporic uh, identity to them. Um, I think that's where the really exciting work in the field has been, you know, maybe for a, a while now, but it, it continues to kind of produce, as I mentioned earlier, this study of, of Irish famine relief mm -hmm. that, you know, looks at uh, Charleston, New York, uh, London, India, right, and kind of looks at them as part of a, 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 a you know, interconnected web of of the Irish diaspora, right? Um, I also think, you know, personally, uh, my my next project is kind of moving on from the Irish, so I, I won't be in the field for, at least for the short term. I think there's maybe more that can be done. You know, way back in like the '70s and '80s, there was a lot of attention to like smaller, maybe even rural Irish uh, mm -hmm. uh, Irish American history. I say smaller places like Butte, Montana, for instance, right, where it's the most Irish place in America. 
by the late 19th century, like per, yeah. per person, right? You're talking about like, I think 40% or so of the, of Butte in the 1880s, 1890s is, is Irish born. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, there's more space perhaps for looking at, um, you know, the, the period I'm most interested in remains. So is the kind of mid 19th century civil war era, mm -hmm. you know, the, the town I currently live in in Massachusetts is a very much a kind of classic, small kind of Yankee community. Right. Um, but in the course of re doing research for revisions to the book, I discovered, well, there's like half dozen or so Irish immigrants that are working in like a straw hat factory in the town. They live in this little kind of cordoned off area of it, like this really miniature kind of um, Irish town, basically. And they all enlist together in this kind of Yankee, you know, uh, uh, um, company mm. and serve the duration of the war together. And then in their personal reminiscences of the, the, the war for the, the local GAR unit that they're all a part of afterwards, they, they talk about their service alongside each other. Right. So mm. yeah, I think Ryan Keating's recent book, relatively recent book, shades of gray kind of tried to look beyond, you know, the New York, Boston, you know, Philadelphia yeah. kind of stories. Right. So maybe looking at those kind of, lesser lesser studied mm -hmm. places you know where the irish are part of um you know less homogeneously irish american communities mm -hmm. would be would be a field for for further research in yeah sort of like what you yeah, have was a lot of other immigration group immigrant groups that are too small to form their own regiments and that exactly are like minor in in size no it, that sounds like there's still a lot of works that PhD students can do if they sure. really want to do the Irish. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, it, you know, looking at it, maybe bridging in some ways that kind of like really hyper local yeah. history with the larger, you know, kind of imperial and diasporic networks that Irish immigrants are, are a part mm -hmm. of would be really fascinating. Uh, a micro me. history and a ma macro history. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which is kind of what my new project is doing, but on a much different topic. So um, yeah. maybe there'll be room for the Irish, you know, down the road. There's always room for a Guinness, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Ian, so much for taking the time today. And just for everyone who got interested in the book or wants to know more about John Mitchell, Thomas Francis Mayer, and the rest of the young Irishmen that come to the United States, the book is Embracing Emancipation. A Transatlantic yep. History of Irish American Slavery and the American Union by Fordham University Press. Thank you so much, Ian. It was a pleasure today. No, Niels, thank you. It's been a, a real pleasure. The chance to you know talk for this long about the book. I could keep going, but appreciate the the questions and um and and, and conversation. I know it. If we it wasn't for the listeners' attention span, <laughs> I would be happy to go for another hour. But no, I think we've gone. We, we've given plenty to the listeners. So yeah, yeah. <laughs>